So I would like to begin by asking you all a question. How many of you here are vegetarians or vegans? Can you please raise your hands? All right, yeah, quite a few, all right. I won't be trying to count. Uh, now I have a tougher question. How many of you, vegetarian and vegans, that's to you, how many of you have eaten meat within the last 24 hours? Okay, no, but not meat eaters, vegetarians and vegans only. How many vegetarians and vegans have eaten meat within the last 24 hours? None? Well, that's actually quite surprising because surveys tend to find something else. One such survey done in the United States has found that 60% of vegetarians and vegans have actually eaten meat within the last 24 hours. And a similar thing has been found in Canada. Meanwhile, in the United Kingdom, almost 40% of vegetarians say that whenever they get drunk, they do eat meat. <laughs> so, Obviously, there is something very powerful about meat that even some vegetarians and vegans just cannot resist. In the fall of 2015, there was a report released. It was a report done by WHO, so the World Health Organization, one of the most important health organizations out there. And in the report, they basically took all the research on meat and cancer, and they have concluded that processed meat, so as pepperonis and hams and bacon, that it causes cancer to humans. And they've put processed meat in the same category of cancerogenic compounds as asbestos. So that was quite serious. And red meat, so unprocessed red meat like pork and beef, uh, they said that it probably causes cancer too. That report in North America, at least, it was all over the media. So press was saying things like meat will kill you, bacon equals cigarettes, all, all these kind of things. And about two months after that report was released, I was sitting in my office and I started wondering how much such a report would scare people away from eating meat. You know, how many people will go out and think, you know, maybe it's not worth risking, maybe I'll, at least I'll try to cut down my consumption, right? So I went to a website run by the producers of beef in North America. I found the most recent sales report and I clicked on the report. When I saw the data, I just couldn't believe my eyes. Basically, the sales were up, not down. So after hearing that meat probably causes cancer, Americans went out and bought more of it. Well, that kind of meat paradox, so the fact that humans love meat so much that despite all the consequences, you know, to our health and the planet and the animals, we still want more of it. It's been something that I've been researching for years now, and I've discovered that there, that there are two main reasons why we love meat so much. And both of those reasons, they go back in time to two and a half million years ago when our ancestors first started eating meat. So what happened those two and a half million years ago was that the climate has changed, in, at least in, on African savannas when our ancestors were living back then. The foods that they were relying on, so some fruits, for example, became less available, harder to find. What became more available was meat, because there were suddenly more grazing animals and more predators killing those animals, and you know, there was just more leftover meat lying around for our ancestors to scavenge, because we were scavengers at first. And most likely by chance, very soon our ancestors discovered that meat was not only edible, it was actually great food. It was full of nutrients and you know, protein and calories and vitamins and minerals. It was really, really good for them. It was so good that actually scientists call it high quality food, especially when you compare it to other foods they were eating. And you know, those people were eating grass and leaves, for example. So today, when you are you know, feeling like a burger or maybe a steak or whatever you know, you eat in Italy, uh, you are probably craving one of three flavors that are found in meat and that we evolved to crave. So the first thing is fat. So the smooth texture of fat in your mouth, the smells connected to fat, to our ancestors, it signified that the food was full of calories. And obviously calories were very important for survival. They wanted more of them. The second thing that we love in the taste of meat is something called umami. Omani in Japanese means delicious, and it's a fifth basic taste. So alongside salty and bitter and sweet is a, is a basic taste. And meat is particularly full of omami, so it's, it's full of deliciousness. And this is why we love it, because to our taste buds, that signifies that this is a food full of protein. 
And to our ancestors, once again, it was very important to love the Domami taste of protein because other foods, we didn't have much of it. So we really had to love it, to evolve to love it. And the third thing we still love in the taste of meat is something called the products of the Maillard reaction. So the Maillard reaction is something that happens, for example, when you grill a burger. So you go past the grill and then you smell this delicious, you know, mouth-watering smells of grilling burger. These are those chemicals. They are produced in a, when you put some certain foods in a hot, dry environment. So you grill them, you roast them, for example. This is also what happens when you bake cookies or, or you toast bread. And we evolved to love those flavors, those smells, because to our ancestors, they meant that the food was cooked. So it was, you know, it was just basically safer to eat. It was no longer full of bacteria and parasites, you know, the, the way kind of raw meat can be, especially when it was scavenged. Uh, so there were those that loved those flavors, they were more likely to survive. And this is still why we love meat so much today, because it was better for our ancestors. But the taste of meat, it's just part of the story. The second part of the story has to do with our culture and psychology. And once again, it goes back to all of those two and a half million years ago to the African savanna. So meat is a very unusual food, especially when you think about the meat that our ancestors ate. So it comes in a rather big package in general, also like a you know, zebra-sized package, and it also spoils fast. So as opposed to other foods that our ancestors were, were eating, it was a perfect food for sharing. You know, if you gather some berries or not, you can just eat all by yourself. But with meat, not really, if you don't have a fridge, it's a food for sharing. So when a hunter or a scavenger bought some meat into the camp, he had power, he had wealth, because he had something that everybody else wanted. And he could decide whether, you know, who will get something, who will get the best piece, who will get the, the smallest piece, who will maybe get nothing. So politics began. And the interesting thing is that our cousins, chimpanzees, they actually also use meat in politics. So when alpha male will get hold of a Colabas monkey, the, the kind of meat they eat most often, uh, he'll exchange it for favors. So kind of, you know, you scratch my back, I'll give you a piece of meat, you know. So they, they use it to form coalitions, for example. Also, in some groups of chimpanzees, scientists have observed that the males will exchange meat for sex with females. And this connection between sex and masculinity, it also played for our ancestors. You know, obviously, it was usually the men who were scavengers and hunters. They were just, you know, bigger than us women, stronger. They were hunting, they were scavenging. And they could decide whether women will get any of that meat that everybody wanted, or maybe they'll get nothing. You know, and very often they did get nothing. Even today, in hunter-gatherer tribes, most meat taboos are directed at women. So women are forbidden to eat many meats. There is one tribe called Hadza in Tanzania. In that tribe, women are forbidden, for example, from eating a meat called epeme. These are the fattiest, so probably the tastiest pieces of big game. And the penalty to women for eating that meat is rape or even death. So this is serious, obviously. So this connection between power and wealth and masculinity, it got ingrained in our culture over centuries and millennia. Another reason for that was something that psychologist Robert Cialdini calls the scarcity principle. So the scarcity principle basically means that the more something is harder to get, the more we want it. So marketers know it very well. For example, when you go to a store and you see an ad saying, you know, buy now, only 10 left, you suddenly want this thing more because there are only 10 left. And the same thing was happening with meat. Because for most of human history, meat was really hard to get. It was scarce. We wanted it even more. In medieval Europe, peasants barely ever saw any meat. Meanwhile, they could observe the aristocracy, or at least hear about aristocracy, stuffing their faces with meat. Sometimes aristocracy in Europe, in the Middle Ages, ate little bat meat. And so the meat became the symbol of wealth once again, like those white faces of aristocratic ladies or their jewelry and their gowns. It was a symbol of wealth. And by now you may be wondering, how does it all apply to us here in the 21st century, in Italy, in the West, when we have, you know, we have abundance of meat, we don't have scarcity of meat, we have as much as we want here in the West. So why would we still believe in this, you know, power and wealth and masculinity? Why would we still believe in that? And there are, again, one, two, two reasons for that. The first one is that the cultures don't change all that fast. When you think about it, during Second World War, it was still scarce in Europe, 
And in some countries, it was even more recent. When I was a child in Poland, which wasn't that long time ago, we had such scarcity of meat that I had to wait for hours in long lines with my mother waiting to get a piece of the sausage. So this is really new history. And the second reason is the meat industry. So the meat industry plays on this ancient symbolism of this long ago history and myths that we have about meat to sell you their products. Their favorite one is meat from an equal masculinity. So basically they tell guys that they need meat to be a real man. And in North America, most major chains of burgers, pizzas, tacos, they did advertisements like that saying, if you're a real guy, you need to eat meat. There was even one advertisement for a giant SUV car in the US. And in that advertisement, you see a vegetarian guy in a store. He buys himself some tofu, some veggies, all this stuff like that. And suddenly he notices another guy who has a cart full of ribs and steak, all these bloody meats. And you can see the vegetarian like, kind of cringe and go small and small. And, and suddenly he notices the ad for the car. He goes to the car salon, buys himself this massive car, and then you see him driving away, all happy now, munching on a carrot, and the original tagline said, restore your manhood. Basically, if you're a guy and you're a vegetarian, you need a giant SUV to feel manly again. And another myth that the meat industry plays on, something that still connects to all this ancient human history that we had with meat, is something called the protein myth. So basically, they keep telling us that just like our ancestors needed meat for its protein content, we still do. But the problem with this theory is that, unlike our ancestors, we have abundance of foods full of proteins. We have lentils, we have beans, we have veggies, we have grains. We are really not short on protein here. We're not eating grass and leaves. Actually, North Americans eat about twice as much protein as they should on average, and this is not good for their health. Even vegetarians, once again, are not immune. There was a study done in Poland in which vegetarian children are eating four times as much protein as they should be. So there's a question I get often asked at this point. So what has happened? Why suddenly meat, that was such a great food for our ancestors, you know, this high quality, nutritious thing, suddenly became something that's bad for us. We should be reducing the consumption, you know, damages our health. What happened? And the thing that happened is that our priorities have changed. For our ancestors, the priority was to survive from one day to the next. They didn't want to starve, and meat was great for that, especially when you, know, you didn't have very much choice. And we have different priorities. We want to live long, we want to have long retirements when we cruise around the globe. And the diseases that meat is connected with, they usually come up later in life. Our ancestors, they didn't have to worry about you know, diabetes at the age of 40 or heart attack at the age of 50 or cancer at 70. They didn't worry about it. They worried about survival. So our priorities have changed, but our taste buds, well, they didn't get the memo, really. They didn't get it. Our brains, they also didn't really get it. The meat industry probably did get it, but they still want to sell you their products. One thing, though, that we should learn from our ancestors is how to adapt. When the climate has changed in the past, they changed their diets. And the climate is changing once again, so we should also change our diets, and we should reduce our meat consumption. Consider just one thing. If everybody on this planet today said we are no longer eating meat, everyone goes vegetarian, from climate change perspective, that would be equivalent of all transportation disappearing from the face of Earth. So no more cars, no more planes, no more scooters, no more buses, no more trucks, absolutely nothing. Just imagine the impact. But we don't want to do that because giving up meat is really, really hard. In a way, it's harder you know, than inventing electric cars or other technological solutions. It's really, really hard. But I believe that if we understand how meat still keeps us hooked, how you know, all this ancient expired symbolism plays us and tricks us into believing that we have to eat meat, how the meat industry plays on those tunes, telling men that to be a real guy is really a man, they have to eat meat. Maybe it will be easier for us to change, maybe just a little bit. If we understand how our taste buds are tricking us into eating meat, maybe it also will be a little bit easier to change. If you feel like you're craving a burger, maybe what you're really craving is protein. Maybe you're craving something fatty, or maybe you're craving those delicious scents of the Maillard reaction. And maybe, for example, a toast with some you know, creamy avocado and melted cheese on top of it would do. So if we understand how meat, meat fools us, 
how it tricks us in a way. Maybe it will be easier to change our diets, even a little bit. Maybe try, you know, meatless Mondays or meatless Sunday afternoon as, as long as it's not raining. Whatever works for you. And maybe, you know, just maybe, even vegetarians and vegans will finally stop eating meat. Thank you.